Hello and welcome to Shadow the Stereotypes, where my intention is to empower Black men to live extraordinary lives. You see, there's never been a shortage of Black male role models. There's only been a lack of exposure of those role models. So the intention here is to showcase and highlight men of color who are doing amazing things around the globe. And so joining me today is a guy who is doing just that. His name is Mr. Tyrone Matheson, and he's out of Canada and my brother to the north, and he is a profit growth consultant, an entrepreneur, an investor, a joint, fin a joint venture and strategic alliance specialist, which is a mouthful. So without further ado, let's welcome Tyrone to the show. Tyrone, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. Really looking forward to a great conversation. We're going to be talking primarily about your business and what you do. But before we do, we want to jump into some icebreaker questions just to kind of <laughs> loosen you up a little bit and get the, let the audience know you a little bit. So first of all, tell us where you're from and just a little bit about growing up. No, it so sounds good. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm actually in Ontario, Canada. I'm just outside of uh, the great city of Toronto, Ontario. Uh, in a small community with uh, my family, a small family, my wife and two kids, boy and girl. I grew up in a small community, uh, probably about uh, about a half hour west of Toronto called Cambridge. Um, again, with my, my, my parents at that point and my, my two two sisters uh, growing up. So I'm, I'm, I guess, one of three. I'm the middle child, older sister and a younger sister. Nice. So... Name a woman who has inspired you to be who you are other than your mom. <laughs> Jeez. See, the, the first place I was going was my, was my mom because she has truly been an intricate part of, uh, of my life in that respect. So, wow, that's a tough one. I, you know, quite honestly, I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, I keep my circle small. So I don't have an extensive network of a lot of individuals that I do interact with. So, you know, as much as you're saying it can't be my mom, you know, actually my, I, the other person that would be is my, my sister. Uh, oh, nice. Actually, both sisters have been really good in, in, in terms of the different perspectives that they bring. And we're extremely close <laughs> to, to one another. So I would, I would look at my, my older sister, Tessa, and my younger sister, Talisha, as being the two women in my life that have helped me to become the man that I am today in terms of my relationship with my wife and my relationship with my, my kids, I can say is because of the women that have been in my life, my sisters and my mother, even though you don't want to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. That, that's wonderful to have that kind of connection with your siblings, man. That, that's awesome. So name a man that you look up to and admire. Ah, a man that I look up to and admire. Again, um, the, the, actually the pastor of my church, I would say, is a man that I've grown to respect and admire over, I don't know, 30 years of, of, knowing, of knowing him and being in their home and understand, like seeing the man in the home and seeing the man outside in the world and seeing the man on the pulpits. Um, it's, he's truly definitely a man that I've, that I've uh, grown to admire. And what's his sure. name? Uh, John. John. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So name a business book that you love and tell me why you love it. You know, I've read a lot of books. <laughs> um, I, I, one book that, uh, that I have on my desk actually here is uh, The One Thing by uh, Gary Keller. And, uh, and it's, kind of, it's not your typical business book. It's more or less a life book, but I apply it to business. And the main thing that, uh, that I gathered out of that book and why I keep on referring to it, even for my consulting business, is that sometimes we get so, many, so distracted with everything else around us and it feels like we're overwhelmed. And the premise of that book is to identify the one thing that you can focus on to help you sort of get that check off and move on to the next thing. So for me, keeping things simple Getting results that you want uh, in business and life is to again focus on one thing that you can control. So that's that's been what I like from the business side of it. I would say the one thing by Gary Keller. That's a, that's a powerful lesson. Focus on one thing at a time. Now, if you love movies, <laughs> share share a movie that you love. 
I'm not much of a movie person, but what's what what's been happening as of late is I've been going back to some of these older movies that I that I that I recall, and just you're looking at things that are happening in the world today. And I'm going to go back to the Matrix from back in the day, mm-hmm. and I'm going to go I'm going to go. Um, and the thing that really jumps out for that is red pill, blue pill. And I'm going to look at where we are today in this world, and I'm going to say there's a lot of people. Um, that are blue pill people and blue pill people are just, they're just going to go with the flow. They're going to accept everything for the way it is. Uh, they're going to listen to the media and just program themselves from the media and just assume that whatever is being said is the truth and just go with that. And then there's the red pill people. The red pill people are those individuals that will do whatever they can to find the truth and to, uh, and to see that there is a world behind beyond what they're, what's communicated to them and they just go that extra mile to try to figure out and navigate and try to understand what the truths are. So I would say like, there's a lot of philosophical stuff in that movie, but um, if there's one thing that comes out that I was reflecting on this week, especially as we're on lockdown, it's uh, the matrix and it's the red pill, blue pill. (laughs) That's actually my second favorite movie of all time, actually. Oh, look at that. (laughs) And uh, the amazing thing about the red pill, blue pill is one of the most powerful lessons in the movie is the power of choice. Power of choice. We get to choose <laughs> whether or not we're going to take the red pill or the blue pill. And that's what I loved about that movie. And like you said, it's very philosophical. If you look at it just surfacy as action, you missed the point of the movie. Oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was really, really deep. Now, if I gave you a magic wand, <laughs> and with this magic wand, you could create anything your heart desires. What would your life look like 10 years from now? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That's, that's, that's good. That's difficult. <laughs> Only because I, I, it's, it's a difficult thing for me to always look that far out. <laughs> um, if I, so if I had a magic wand, you had a magic wand, where would I basically 10 years from now, what would I do now? My goodness. You know, I, I have, I, I, again, I have something within me for community and building something around youth. I've been getting involved with uh, helping other individuals with development type projects that are humanitarian related. I think if that wand was right now, it would sort of the freedom to be able to do more of that humanitarian related stuff in terms of not only helping myself in terms of what I envisioned that I would like to build, but being able to uh, open that door for other people so that those ideas that they have, they're able to go out and execute because of the humanitarian impact that I know they want to achieve, but sometimes they limit either their mind or they look at the resources they have and they're not, they just don't see anything beyond that. So yeah. that, that'd probably be it. That was a good, yeah, that's good. Yeah, see, I love, I, I have this intuition. Actually, I had this intuition about you when we connected on LinkedIn. And uh, I said, you know, this is a brother that I like to connect with. And, and, and as, as you were answering that question, I can see how we're kindred spirits in that we're both committed to being in service to humanity in some way, making a positive impact on the world. And um, I think that's why we've been brought together. So I'm looking forward to see, seeing what happens in the future. But uh, yeah, thank you for, for sharing that. That's you and great. me both. <laughs> now, there are some people who are optimistic about the future, while others are pessimistic about the future. So where do you fall on that spectrum between optimism and pessimism for the future in general? Where do you fall? So you're talking to a believer of God. <laughs> so when I look at purpose-driven life, it, it, I only see optimism. I only see what can be uh, and the good. Um, the way I look at it, despite, and there's, you know, verses, and I'm not going to get all religious, but um, sometimes when we're going through what we're going through, that's all we can see. But I, always, but I know, and again, it's just intrinsically, that the end is always better than the beginning. <laughs> and you know you can you can look at it from a diamond and the process that you have to, that a diamond has to go through in order to become a diamond or gold 
the process that gold has to go uh, to go through being heated to high degrees in order to become gold. And I believe that for everyone that's going through a situation or for myself personally, that just despite whatever I'm going through, the end is always going to be better than what I'm going through. So I always try to keep that top of mind that, you know, always try to look for the good, the good, the good, the good, because wherever you're at now is just temporary. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's hard. It's not, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's, uh, that's, that's what I try to do. Sure. And you know, my, my, my belief is actually pretty simple from a metaphysical perspective. Humanity always experiences breakdowns before breakthroughs. And so currently humanity is experience a breakdown. But yep. breakdowns are always preparations for breakthroughs. So if we will stay the course, stay focused, I believe there's bigger breakthroughs on the other side of this. So again, I'm an irrepressible optimist. So I see it from that perspective. The universe is perfect. It knows exactly what it's doing. So we exactly. just align ourselves with that and understand that from my belief system, there's nothing but good. <laughs> stuff happens without question. Yes. Stuff can be really uncomfortable. But if we're willing to look deeply enough, there's a lesson and a gift in every adversity. I really, I really believe that. So I agree too. So with that being said, now I'd like you to introduce Tyrone the professional. So <laughs> tell the audience what you do. You know, I, I listened to the intro uh, prior and, and the simplest thing that I've been saying to people now is that I'm a connector. I'm a problem solver. Um, and, and with that opens it up to <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> so outside of consulting uh, small businesses, um, uh, and again, when I'm going into small businesses, uh, we're helping them to identify opportunities within their business and helping them look at things strategically differently. Uh, so that they can always get more. That's sort of, you know, what I do from the consulting side. Um, if, I, if I'm talking to a real estate developer and they're developing a project and they're running into financial problems and I'm the connector at that point, I got people that I'll connect you to. Or if you're a startup and you're trying to figure out how to get to that next level, again, sometimes, I, you know, I'm, I'm, always, I'm, I'm always trying to solve. I'm a problem solver. So I'm always trying to connect those dots and really con uh, connect people to the, to the solutions or to the answers that they're looking for. Nice. So you're a cons consultant. Consultant would be the easiest way for, for okay. most people that are out there and you want to put me in a little box. It's the consultants, <laughs> but like I would say non-conventional strategic type consultant. <laughs> gotcha. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious, how did you go from, cause I'm sure there was a, corporate job before all of this so yes. what were you doing before <laughs> and how did you transition to being a consultant to consultant so i background i spent a lot of years as a financial advisor uh, so i worked as an independent stocks and bonds and in that world and then i went into the banking world um, same idea, more on the financial planning side of things. Always had within me that I wanted to teach, but didn't quite understand. I knew that it wasn't teaching in the school system. Um, I, I just knew that part, but I didn't know what aspect of teaching I would be going into. When I was a financial planner, I got, um, I did my adult teaching certificate and all that stuff and was teaching out of college part time. And that, I was like, okay, I was feeling good at that point. I'm teaching at a college, um, a postgraduate course. And I was just doing it part-time while I was a financial advisor. And then I was still digging deep. Okay, there has to be more to this. So at that point, I went into uh, another financial organization. And I was in the training department at that organization. So I went from an advisor to now I'm just training. And I developed curriculum. And then I would go out there and facilitate that curriculum to individuals. And I did that for about two years. And I think it was one day I had a group that I was facilitating on a, on a regular basis. And I got out and I said, listen, I'm teaching all of these advisors on how to build a successful financial business. So these are insurance agents. And here I am, I have all these side hustles on the side that I'm doing and I'm teaching these guys how to do it. And I literally at that point, and I was doing some research before, but I had called up my boss and said, I'm done and gave her my two weeks notice that <laughs> I can remember her words. I've never had anyone quit on me before. <laughs> I'm like, well, uh, you know, here's your first. And from that point, what I had, what I had done is I went into um, leadership development. 
So I, I, I always had an interest in uh, just, just learning more about myself and so forth. And I started selling leadership development programs into um, uh, small businesses. And then after three years of that, I'm like, okay, these business owners, they're buying and they're spending a ton of money on these programs, but they're not executing and implementing any of the stuff that I'm really teaching them. So for me, it was like, okay, I'm going to, I created another entity where I'm like, okay, I'm going to still have that piece, but I'm going to go help these business owners put systems and processes in place and just get, start doing stuff in their business. And that was literally that flip from that point, because now I was working hand in hand with the small business owners, seeing what they were doing. Um, at some point, a couple of years ago, I got to the point where it's like, okay, I just created another job for myself by doing all of this work now, helping these businesses. And uh, at that point, decided I wanted to get become the strategic guy. I will work with business owners, but from a strategic level, I'm going to direct them and lead them. So really, it started from that vision of I've always wanted to teach. And now I figured out the, the way I'm teaching is by helping them strategically by directing and leading them. So become more of a facilitator. So that was that seed that I had planted from a little kid that I wanted to teach. It ended up being that versus the traditional, hey, I'm a teacher in a school. Nice. Now, again, I'm, I'm a huge fan of entrepreneurship. And so there's somebody that's watching this thing right now and they're going, dang, I, I, I want to take that leap. I want I want to <laughs> I want to do my own thing. I want to I want to, you know, but there's this fear. I'm just I'm just scared. So how did you deal with that initial fear to just make that jump? Or was there fear when you, when you jumped? It's, it's funny. So I'm one of the ways that I approach uh, different situations, because I have other little businesses that I have on the side as well. And one of the key things for me is what is the worst case scenario? Mm. That's the question I ask every single time. What is the worst case scenario? So I'll give you an example. I have a shared office space. Uh, that I own where we rent out desks and all that stuff for people to come in and work and so forth. And when I had one, so this building's about uh, 2000 square feet. And when I went in there, I looked around and I'm like, okay, this is the space we're going to be in. That was three years ago. And I asked myself, what is the worst case scenario that can come out of this? And the worst case scenario for me for that situation was I will be, I'll be the only one in this space by myself working, but I'll still be able to manage and pay the rent. That was my worst case scenario. So I was like, okay, well, that, that's, that's easy because <laughs> whether or not I get people or not, I got a nice big office if I'm going to be here by myself. So it works out. And that's how I jumped into it. Because I always try to look at what is that worst case scenario that can come out of it? And do I have a solution for that worst case scenario? If I don't have a solution for it, there's no way I'm, I'm jumping in. But if I do have a solution that makes sense for me and I can really put pieces together, then I jump in. So that's what I've, that's what I've done is I, I, I've always looked at it. Like, what do I have, what, what can I do to make this work? And what's the worst thing that can happen out of this? And can I deal with it if that happens? Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic mindset to have. Unfortunately, most people will focus on worst case scenarios <laughs> when they're thinking about making that leap it's like oh my gosh this is going to happen this is going to happen versus what could happen the the good side of it and so it's 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 really difficult um to make it is. It because of cultural conditioning we're conditioned to be scared all the time so that's why it's so important to maintain this positive mental attitude so that you can have the strategies in your mind that help you overcome those fears so one of the things i do as a speaker you know, people ask me, do I get scared when I get on stage? And I can say, absolutely not. I, I don't get afraid at all because what I feel when I'm getting ready to speak is, is, is excitement. And if you ask yourself, if you feel in your body, excitement feels exactly like fear. It's, yeah. the same energy. it's the same energy in your body. The only difference are the thoughts that you're having about that energy. So I, I agree with you 100% on that. You know, last night I was uh, I was reading, and uh, the word for me was meditation. And when people think of meditation, they just think of calm and peace and all that stuff. Well, if you look at it, meditation is really about what are you what are you taking your mind and focusing in on? Because I can meditate on negative, 
and have that thought replay over and over and over in my head. I can meditate on something positive and replay that thought over and over in my head. So, you know, it, to your, to your point, it's, 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 it is a thought thing. I'm not, and it's not an easy transition to, to do that leap. Trust me, cause you're going to have uh, opposition internally, possibly you're going to have opposition externally <laughs> and you're going to have to try to figure out how to, what's true. What's the truth back to that choice piece that we were talking about earlier, right? What's the truth and, and what you're going to use to either motivate you or uh, to, you know, make you go back to the comfort of security of a job, whatever that is. Yeah. Cause as far as I'm concerned, there is no security. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so and it's interesting, you bring up the, the word meditation. And I've been meditating for almost 30 years now. And there's a misconception about meditation. As you mentioned, some people think that meditation is about your mind going blank and you're not thinking about anything. Meditation really is simply the state of being aware of what you're thinking. <laughs> that's, yep. that's really meditation. So when you can interrupt your thinking, yes. you, can change. you can change. If you're on automatic and you're not paying attention to what you think, and then you, you, you react instead of respond. And so reaction comes from not being aware. <laughs> so the process of meditation simply gives you an opportunity to, in each moment, be aware that you do have choice. <laughs> it's you do true. have choice based on what you think. So that's, that's really powerful, and we can really get into that deeper, but I wanna go through the rest of this. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, my latest book is titled The Cure for Onlyness, A Black Man's Guide to Joy, Passion, and Purpose. And the book addresses what I call a feeling of onlyness, where we as men of color are sometimes in environments where we're the only person of color. And so I'm assuming that you've probably had that experience, especially <laughs> being a brother in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, so have you had that experience? And how did you, de how do you deal with it? It's, it's, I only know that I've had that experience because I'm always looking back. When you're in it, it's very different. So uh, even from growing up, I could look at from the elementary school to the high school that I was in, there was probably five black people <laughs> that you could sort of, or people of color that you can sort of count on your hand and you know, you know who they were. Um, and, and as I got older and stuff, I went to university and, and started in the workforce. So I, my first job was in the financial services industry. Again, being here in Canada, predominantly Caucasian, uh, men of color, women of color, not really in that industry. I remember going to an event and I think there's probably about a thousand people in there and there's probably about 10 of us in that. Right. But again, I'm looking back now, right. When I was there at that point, I didn't really um <laughs> see it um even being an entrepreneur today in terms of what i'm doing um uh, as a consultant and so forth very limited it's typically again no disrespect but it's typically an older male caucasian consultant that's kind of you know so when you have you know 43 year old african american <laughs> that's consulting businesses for like i don't know the last 12 years it's just it's different right um but what I learned from that, just on the flip side of it, people remember you. <laughs> so I'd go to a networking event or I'd go to an event or, or whatever it is. And although I may have been the only man of color in that room, people remembered. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I have a lot of business relationships that I've been able to develop leveraging the fact that I'm the only African-American male. They're going to remember a guy named Tyrone. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's easy right versus you know i, I can imagine that again that's just a mindset thing that i've done for myself versus you know john's and michael's or you know i'm just being stereotypical here but it's i have a very difficult time on that side trying to keep things straight because there's there's a lot <laughs> like it's, there's a lot of um people that are not of color Right. Right. So it just becomes very difficult uh, to keep things in straight. But I would say, yeah, looking back now, it was it was difficult, especially here in Canada. You know, and and the whole intention of this podcast is to engage in conversation with men like yourself um, 
because I know for most of my life I've had this feeling because on one hand, I'm rejected by people who look like me because I think differently <laughs> because I'm an optimist. I don't, I don't buy into victim mentalities and I don't, I don't think society can keep me from accomplishing anything I set my mind to. And I've been rejected as a result of that way of thinking. On the other hand, you go in environments where you're the only person of color and you get that feeling. <laughs> it's just a feeling that people are kind of like, you know, so they have their opinions and judgments about you just based on the color of your skin. So that's that that onlyness feeling. But what I what I admire about what you're doing and what you've done is that you simply focused on your own success. You haven't allowed the color of your skin to keep you from accomplishing the things that you knew you were capable of. And that's the whole intention of this show. I want to challenge men of color to recognize, yes, racism is real. Yes, there are challenges out there, but yet I believe, this is my belief, there's never been a better time to be, on a, be alive on this planet than right now. That is, that is my firm belief. And despite what we're seeing in the media, black men can and are succeeding at unprecedented levels. You just don't see it in the media. And that's why I put together this podcast to showcase and highlight men of color like yourself. Now, with that being said, yes. Here in America, obviously, we get tons and tons of news stories about police brutality and high incarceration rates and all of that. Do you have that same experience in Canada in terms of negative media stories about men of color? Is it the same there? In, in the bigger cities, so like at Toronto, it's you pretty much you put on the news for that area and that's all you hear is the, the latest shooting that happened last night within again there's certain hot spots in Toronto and they just seem to be the highlight every single night in those areas um, depending on where you are in Canada because you could go to some other areas where there's not a lot of African American or people of color in those areas where you don't get you don't see any of that stuff you don't even hear about it so I think here in Canada, it all really depends on where you live. And but because I'm not too far from the Toronto area, it's it's all the time. Like I could go put the TV on right now, just put it on the channel, and I'm like, okay, this is what happened last night. There was a, some shooting or some something that happened, and you know, here's the wanted people, right? But uh, that would be the, the what we see in the media here. Probably not so prevalent as you know the U.S. But that you know now on 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 Canadian television in terms yes. of reporters and stuff like that do you see a lot of people of color i mean you know just in general media no we, no 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 there there are uh, we, there are certain channels on the tv that are dedicated to uh different minority groups and at the odd time you'll see those different minority groups but in terms of from a news perspective or any of that stuff not even from a really, even from a sports perspective, you see a lot of Africa, like we don't, very different. It's like night and day, the US and Canada. Yeah. Um, yeah, we don't really see that here in terms of uh, men of color, women of color being uh, front and center in these different media type outlets. Yeah, and the good news here in America is it's obviously changed a lot. A couple of reasons. Number one, I don't know if you've heard, but they recently released the uh, Black News Channel. Have you, see, have you seen that one? I haven't even seen it. There's a guy uh, named J.C. Watts who was a Republican politician oh, 20 years ago. He was real, real popular um, in America. Black Republican, which again, that's a you know, topic of discussion. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, J.C. Watts put together uh, a group of people and um, they've put together uh, the Black News Channel, BNC. And I've, I've watched bits and pieces of it. Um, the sad part about any media that comes out there, it just has this thing that our society is driven on negativity. <laughs> and so even though it's predominantly black, well, actually it's all black, <laughs> uh, host, you know, reporters, uh, writers, and so forth, there's still that negative slant to it. Uh, it's a it's a new channel, so I'm I'm I'm, I'm reserving judgment for a while <laughs> <laughs> to to kind of you know give them some leeway to hopefully improve some of their programming. But 
from my perspective though, it just it goes to show you how things are changing in that people of color now have outlets like that where you can have you know a black news channel in and of itself, which is to me signs of progress. You know, that's just kind of how I see it. Sign, definitely signs of progress. And now I remember in the 60s when I was a kid, and anytime there was a black person on television, it was a big event. <laughs> I mean, people were picking up the phone, they're calling each other to say, oh, look, black person on television. <laughs> and, and so from my perspective, if you look at the eternality of time, you know, 50 years is a pretty short time frame to go from not having black people on television to black people now owning television. So I was like, yeah, that's progress for me. That's, that's just kind of how I see it. But anyway, just curious, um, you know, the brother from the North up in Canada, what your experience has been. <laughs> I'm sure it's very similar to what we experience here. It, it is just, and then you, and again, your world is probably in the U.S. is probably very much different than what we experience here in Canada in terms of media and all that other stuff. Uh, I, I think you you have more all of your media. Well, like we're feeding the media from the U.S. here up into Canada, right? So it's not like we have our own <laughs> like content or anything of that nature, but. It, yeah, your perspective is definitely going to be different than than my even the community that I'm in right now. Like, there's we don't have a lot of African American. Like, it's it's just the way it is. But it's very diverse in terms of other cultures and all that other stuff as well. Well, starting to it wasn't like that 15 years ago. I was probably the only guy here. <laughs> but uh, like, things are changing, right? Yeah. To your point, yeah. things are changing. Yeah, and I'm, I'm curious because one of the things that um, I've experienced most of my life, as a matter of fact, my very first book I wrote back in 1995, the title of the book was Brothers Are You Listening? A Success Guide for the 90s. And the very first chapter was called the That's What White People Do Mentality. <laughs> <laughs> and in that chapter, I talked about, you know, for most of my life, how I was accused of trying to be white because of some of the choices that I made. Interesting. Obviously from black people. So I'm curious, <laughs> have you had that same experience? I, I would say growing up, it was more so growing up and it probably had to do, and even I look at my my parents, and hopefully they don't watch this, but, <laughs> my, but, but I've listened, like even my parents and the way they were brought up, right? If they're brought up in the islands, you know, the Caribbean, that's what they were used to, right? Even like, even when you dated, you, you know, I should be looking for a African American woman. Well, I'm in a community where there, there ain't any, and it just so happens that my wife is actually Caucasian because that's you know, and it's not. But I've never been one to. I I, I guess I never saw all of that. I never I never really saw all of that growing up. I think I maybe I just had the eyes of a child at that point where everyone was. It's just people. Like I just yeah. saw people for people until you started getting older and you started to realize. Yeah, there's some groups do things very differently, and maybe it's because of the environment they're in or whatever. I, you know, but and then there's some groups that do things very differently when it comes to that as well. So it's been an interesting journey. <laughs> so, so, so how is, um, shall I say, interracial marriages accepted in Canada? Is there is that a big issue or? It, it no, it it's. It's it's the it's the norm in some areas, right? Where you it, it's a very acceptable. Um, nice. Good. And again, I've I've experienced it both ways. And the negative, unfortunately, I experienced in the U.S. It wasn't even in Canada, and it was um, it, it was probably about twelve years ago. And I won't say the city that we're in, but I, I, I was shocked. We were shocked at because that was only like you know. About 12 years ago, that's not, you know, 2008. Um, and the stuff that we were uh, hearing at that point, uh, you know, as a couple, it was like, you, you, you got to be, you yeah. got to be kidding. <laughs> like <laughs> in this day and age, I, when we go to some remote areas in Canada, don't get me wrong, uh, I'm not picking on the US, there are some remote areas in Canada as well where people look at you kind of funny as well. Because, you know, my wife's Caucasian, my kids look Hawaiian. <laughs> like, it's like, what the heck happened here, right? But in some areas, they're only used to Caucasian. That's yeah. it. 
So they know when you're out, you're an outsider coming into their right. town, right? So, <laughs> but it, it is what it is. You know? There you go. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad to see you're smiling about it. That's what you're. <laughs> All right. So now let's talk about entrepreneurship. Yes. So again, it is my belief that there has never been a better time to be an entrepreneur than right now. As a matter of fact, I've just finished a, a presentation called Joy, Passion, and Profit. And in the presentation, I talk about the three barriers that used to keep people from starting businesses, which no longer apply. Number one, being education. Number two, uh, being location. And number three, being funding. See, those used to be the three primary barriers that kept people from starting business. Now, those things, they're not gone away, obviously, but it's easier now than ever. Or should I, let's, let's change that. There's a distinction to be made between simple and easy. So it's simpler now to start a business than ever before. Yes. <laughs> my belief. So with that being said, what are your thoughts around that, 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 that uh, statement? It's better. It's the best time to be an entrepreneur than right now. I, I, I agree with you 100%. Um, and, uh, and again, a lot of that's going to be thinking. Um, I see it's easy to start any business. Um, regarding the sustainability of that business and the impact that business is going to have, that's another question. Because I think there's a lot of uh, people starting stuff, but and they're in business for themselves now, but it's not sustainable. So the flip side of it is um, there's a lot of problems that we have out there. And with all those problems, creates the opportunities for a lot of people that have ideas and entrepreneurship to create businesses around solving those problems. And I think if anyone wants to become an entrepreneur in this day and age, they either just look around them, see what the problems are out there and what they can solve. And if they can, if they can do something to solve a lot of those problems, they're going to do quite well, not only solving those problems, but they're going to be making a lot of money going forward because they're really solving a real world problem. Right? Absolutely. Now your tagline says on your website, we maximize the revenue, profits, and value of small businesses. Now, I love that. The question becomes in terms of sustainability. Yes. <laughs> How do you do that? What is there in your consultancy practice? You go in and you identify problems and challenges. How, how exactly does your consulting work work? So it starts exactly with what you just said. What is the problem that you're experiencing in your business today? And then once we identify what that problem is and we do, you know, the root cause and trying to figure out, dig deep, I, I, I talk to people, I said, you know, let's pretend, let's get rid of all the noise out there and let's look at business from a very simple standpoint. There are three, four ways to grow a business and it doesn't include Google AdWords, Facebook ads and all the other stuff. It's number one is to get paying customers. Number one. Number two is to get paying customers to buy often from you. <laughs> and, and, and number three is to increase the dollar amounts that paying customers are buying from you. That's it. So get paying customers, increase the frequency of which they're buying from you and get them to buy more from you. That's it. Outside of that, there is no other way to grow the top line of your business. So that's from us on the maximizing side of it. From the profit side of things, it's really about cost. What are things you can cut that's going to increase the bottom line? And a lot of us are not wired to think cut. What do I want to cut? I just want to have and get. <laughs> so when we go into business, we keep it very simple. We only focus on those three drivers on growing a business. And we start internally with what a business already has. And if they don't have, because the flip side of it is, well, Tyrone, I don't have any customers or anything yet. Okay, great. Let's, then who has your customers? And what kind of partnerships can we have with those individuals that have your part that have your customers where you're going to be providing value to that customer. You're going to be helping them solve the problem that they're solved that that other business is solving. And how can you guys all work collaboratively to make that happen? So there's always a way around it, whether or not you have existing customers or you don't, it's just looking, it's just looking at things differently. We're just wired, man, I have a business okay, I think I need to go spend money now <laughs> on all these ads and all that stuff because now I'm just trying to attract people. And it's like, nah, there's lots of easier ways to do that that don't cost any money. And that's, the, that's sort of our approach to business. 
on maximizing nice. revenue and profits and the value. Nice. Now, <clears throat> I worked for a company once and they hired these consultants to come in because uh, obviously the business was struggling. And to be completely honest, these guys were nutcases. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, now I, I love business. And again, I'm, I'm working for someone else. So I, I didn't have any input or say so when the consultants were there. But when the consultants would leave and we'd have our little group get togethers, I was very, I was very vocal. I mean, I'm saying, look, here's why I don't think that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm always open to change. I'm, I'm always open to change because I think that's the, that's the key because the only thing constant is change. There are a lot of people wearing these consultancy hats these days. Yes, there Every, are. Everybody's a business coach. Everybody's an expert, <laughs> you know, and just like, how do you cut through the noise to find the person that can bring the most value to you? So my question to you is, how do you set yourself apart from all the other guys out there that are saying, I've got the solution to your problem? No, that's, that's a, that's a good point. We've, there are a lot of consultants. There are a lot of coaches out there. Um, and some of them are good. <laughs> some of them are just terrible <laughs> and they just have it in, in, in name. One of the things that we've done to separate ourselves from all the other consultants out there. And it's, some of it's just language. We use non-conventional. We, we, we tell people we're not, we're not conventional It's non-conventional. Those other people out there are going to look at other ways on how you could spend money to grow your business. We like to look at the assets or what you already have in your business. Or we look at, like to look at your network and who's in your network and start from there before we start going out. So a lot of what we do is really focusing on internal. So that ties back to when I got into consulting, it was leadership development all started internally. It was the man in the mirror moment that everyone had or was supposed to have and learning more about themselves before and then projecting that on the outside. I took that same methodology from to the, to the tangible side of the business. You want to, you're struggling and you're having challenges in your business. Let's look internally before we start looking at what we can be, can be done externally. So we very strategic from a strategic standpoint, I would say we're extremely strategic in terms of, um, trying to create solutions and opportunities, leveraging what they already have in their business and being creative with what they have. I'd rather that than try to add a whole bunch of stuff that they're not doing. They don't have, I, I meet, I try to meet people where they're at. Where are you at? <laughs> let's meet there and let's figure out how to build around that. Now, I think one of the, the challenges for companies is I, I personally believe that the person at the top, the owner, the presidency, or whoever, <laughs> his values, beliefs, consciousness, whatever you want to call it, filters down through the rest of the organization. I agree. A lot of times what will happen is the guy at the top will bring some people in to try to fix the problem, but he's really the problem. <laughs> and he doesn't recognize he's the problem. So how, can you, how do you get to the top to make sure that the information you're providing trickles down and is implemented? No, and that's a good point. Uh, simple answer, we only work with the top. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so if, if leadership hasn't bought in to exactly what we're doing and how we're gonna, how we're gonna go about doing it, then we don't work with that organization. Mm. And because of my experience on the leadership development side of things, the owners of the organization, they go through the same assessments that everyone else is going to go through. So we do start like from an intrinsic, uh, intangible intrinsic standpoint, we start with vision, mission and all that other stuff for an organization. But it all starts with that owner of the organization. What are your strengths as an individual? What are you good at? What are your innate uh, abilities and so forth? And if we can understand that, Sometimes it's quickly to say, you know what, I can see why you're having problems in your organization. And it's, it's, it's not to say you're the problem. It's like there's usually a communication problem in terms of how you communicate or 
or how you uh, you share information in an organization. Um, your people, you need someone like a right hand man, woman beside you to be that go between. You're in, right? Or you can usually see that within a, a leader of an organization. But to, to your point, we don't just, when someone hires us on, we only deal with the C suite. And once we're with the C suite, then we start looking at how do we tie everyone else in. We don't go to the main level and then try to work ourselves up. That's that's death. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. I mean, I've I've seen that too many times. And again, I I look at everything through a, a, a metaphysical, spiritual lens. And 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 when I talk about consciousness, when I talk about businesses and entrepreneurs, I I really believe that the person at the top. <laughs> Whatever they hold firmly to and yes. the values and again mission and if they aren't willing, yep. <laughs> <laughs> then nothing can change. Nothing can change. And a, a good example of this is diversity and inclusion conversations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we know, heard the same conversations in Canada. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so you got these people saying, okay, we need to have a diversion and inclusion division, you know, whatever. <laughs> so they hire these people to come out and talk about diversion and inclusion, and yet they're racist. I mean, <laughs> it's, 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 it's interesting. So, okay. So let's. I won't even go down that road, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another show. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole nother show. So, so let me ask you this, though. Yes. How important today are social media strategies? It's not, you know, it's not really even about the strategies. It's um, the more that we get, technology is good. And the more that that becomes a part of your business is a matter of how do you strategically use technology to help solve or get to where you want to go. So <laughs> I, I love, I, like, I think technology is, is going to be a huge, intricate part of every single business. It's how do you leverage and how do you use it? to make it work for you. So for, for, uh, for my business, um, I'm not on Facebook. I don't need to be on Facebook. Um, I don't need to be on Instagram. Um, I don't need to be on Twitter. I don't need to be on these sites. Where do I need to be? I need to be on LinkedIn because LinkedIn has over probably 600 million C-suite, every suite type of executive that I want to be in front of all over the world. Uh, so for me, that's the platform of choice for myself. So again, um, now it's how do you use it once when you've identified that platform because it's all about for me relationships and and creating relationships so i, I think yeah social media is going to be a huge part of every business you just got to pick the platform that makes sense for the audience that you're serving yeah that's 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 the key that's the key now just off the top of your head and this this list could be but for an entrepreneur that's watching this yes and they're thinking about launching this business. What are just a few of the biggest mistakes you see entrepreneurs make from the beginning? <laughs> I made all those mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, raise, and, I'll raise my hand. I'll raise right. My hand. So, because we're tangible beings, um, we we start to start putting things together. So, I want a website. So now you've just went and spent a lot of money on putting a website together. Like you have no strategy whatsoever, but you know, you need a website, uh, you know, and then you start spending money. I need this marketing stuff. So I, I think one of the biggest mistakes is not sitting down and really mapping out, honestly, the, the, pro the, the problem that you're solving and who has that problem. So really getting clear on your market and who you're targeting and the, this more importantly, the problem you're solving and then on the flip side of that is what is what is your solution to solve that problem? If if every entrepreneur has started there, then it'd be easier at that point to say, you know what, here's how I'm going to build up my website. Here's the here's the message that I need to have on my website. Here's the social media platforms I need to be on. Here's the people that I need to connect with because you've been able to identify that piece. So I would say the biggest thing right now is entrepreneurs are not identifying what problem they're solving and, and where to, where to find those people that have that problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I have to admit, I am, I am guilty, uh, <laughs> guilty of the whole website thing. Cause, Cause number one, I love building websites. And so the downside of that is every time I see something new on, Oh, I gotta put that on my website. Oh, I gotta put that. 
and I don't need, I don't need it. It's just it's something that I love, but it, there's no return on investment, and really extensive, complicated websites are a waste of money for the most part if you don't have the right niche and you're finding the people that want to buy your stuff. It's it's a it's a digital business card. Yeah, exactly. And it just adds maybe some validity that you have a presence. But to date, good or bad, I don't think anyone's reached out to me on my website to say, hey, I just got to reach out to talk to this guy because I wanted to hire him to do this. It's, it's, it's always been talking to individuals and leveraging my network. And that just becomes an asset that people can go to if they want further information, right? To check out who Tyrone is, right? Yeah. Or to have like the social media. To, oh, he's actually on some other platforms, right? He looks like a legit guy or whatever. Um, but outside of that, um, I look at people that I know that I do business with today that, that they don't have a website. They're not on social media and they're doing quite well uh, financially because they leverage relationships and the power of relationships. Right. So it, it, to each his own when it comes to that. Right. Yeah. And, and again, you, you have to know, number one, as you mentioned, your niche, for example, I have to have a website because as a speaker, as I'm promoting myself, if I'm sending in a proposal for a person to come speak at their organization, they want to know a little bit about me. They want to see me in action. They want to you know, get the basics. So yes, websites are important. Don't, don't hear that guys. If you, if you, <laughs> if you're watching, oh, they are, they are. <laughs> websites are important, but it's really about understanding that if you don't, as Tyrone said, if you don't know what pain points you're trying to solve. <laughs> yes. And the people who need, to solve those pain points, you got to do that first. That's number one. <laughs> and, then, and then things will work out for you. So now, next. Now, you also mentioned on your website uh, that you're a venture capitalist. Yes. And I'm curious from your perspective with all the knowledge and understanding you have in entrepreneurship and so forth, what do you as an a venture capitalist look for in a company that's maybe looking for some startup capital. What are you What are you looking for? So I'm gonna. I, so I'm gonna go. Let me answer. Let me look at it this way. Sometimes I play. I have a play on words. I use a language that I know is gonna resonate with a lot of people. So by saying that I'm an investor or venture capitalist, immediately people think capital. Right? That's the first part they go to. And for myself, that could be a network of individuals that I connect you to that you don't have right now. That could be me taking my equity and my time and my resources and put it into your business. That could be an infusion of money. So in terms of what we're looking for in a business, well, are they, for me personally, it's, are you, is your business viable? Are you really solving a problem? I don't like gadgets. I don't like things that I don't see um, being around a long time or, or having impact. If it's not going to have impact and it's just some kind of gadget kind of thing, I have no desire whatsoever, even from a consulting standpoint, working with businesses like that. I, I don't care what, you know, they have their vision, mission. That's great. I'm just not the guy for me. What gives me passion is when you have something that's really solving a problem out there and I get to be part of that, and I can bring capital. So we do have individuals within our network that do will do the cash infusion. There's myself that will consult for equity in your business, right? So now you're getting all the expertise and all that stuff for, yeah, just give me a piece. And you're not probably paying anything to make that happen. Um, we'll set up partnerships, but they have to be solving a real problem that's going to have impact. That's the major thing. And again, from a leadership standpoint, the individuals we work with, they have to be open-minded. Like if they're, if you're working with someone that like just hard headed and you're coming out with ideas and they're shutting you down every single time for the idea, then it's like, forget it. This is not going to, this is not going to work because if one strength that I have is my mind is always going and I'm always coming up with ideas on how to look at, and I look at things differently than how some people may look at them. Um, and if you're getting rejected over and over and over, it just doesn't make for a healthy relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Last question. <clears throat> and I know absolutely nothing about this, but I want to learn and maybe from you, but 
I'm noticing a lot of people talking about <clears throat> cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, things like that. What do you think about that? And is that something that you participate in? I, I and to, to, to be honest, I don't participate in it because I don't understand it. Okay. Um, I, I just, I just, I don't understand a digital world yet. Um, I can see, you know, with all that we're going on right now, I can see how digital is becoming an intricate part of our lives. Um, I get concerns when I start seeing the idea of what my money's just floating around out there somewhere. <laughs> it's probably happening like that from a banking system right now, but I'm in, there's a lot of tradition in me that I like to go to the bank. <laughs> I like to put my card in. I like to get hard cash and put it in my pocket. When things start moving to another realm where everything's digital, um, I, I watched something the other day, and this will probably put it into context. The idea that even computers, you know, I take a picture on my phone, my phone, it backs it up to the cloud. Now it's in the cloud somewhere. I have money now and I want to buy something. That's in the cloud somewhere. Like my whole life is in the cloud somewhere. And I, I, lo I log in front of a computer and I, 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 what, I forgot my password. And, and now I can't get the pictures that I, that I just took or get access to stuff because, because I've been blocked out from this whole other network out there. So as much as I can see us advancing in technology, there's a freedom or liberty thing that I think gets taken away from us when we start relying so much on leveraging technology in the cloud for financial, for pictures, for all my documents and all that other stuff. I know we're doing it for the convenience piece and you can get access to your OneDrive or your Google from anywhere in the world, but I think what's going to end up coming with all of this stuff is um, someone else is going to have control out of all this stuff. Yeah. And uh, it's just another way to take away from our freedom or our liberty. That's just me being philosophical. <laughs> but that's, that's why I, as much as all this stuff is growing out there, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Just give me my old traditional bank system. <laughs> 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 but it'll be coming. I, like, I, I know it'll be coming at some point. We're just not ready. Yeah, because there's, um, you know, the um, singer Akon? Yes. Yeah. Did you hear Canadian, about the, yeah. the thing that he's doing in Africa where he's got his whole, basically he set up a city and his city, which is housing and businesses and so forth, but he's created his own currency, basically, where he offered, you know, had initial coin offerings, I think it's called where he raised money through this plat this digital platform and he's literally putting together like a little city. And again, I don't know enough about it to yeah. say yay or nay, but it's happening. <laughs> it's, it's it's happening. It's, and it's not and like I said, it's, it's not gonna go anywhere. Yeah. yeah. I, I think there will be a time where everything we do is gonna be digital. Yeah. It's just I'm not ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Well, I will, I, I will make a suggestion for you to consider. There's a guy named Peter Diamandis um, that I follow. Okay. His latest book is called The Future is Faster Than You Think. Yes. Have you ever heard that? No, heard I haven't. No, but I... <laughs> make, make, a, make a notation. Yeah, I will. It is an amazing, amazing book. And for optimists, um, it, it'll light you up. Uh, on some level, it might scare the hell out of you, too, um, because what they're talking about in terms of gene sequencing and uh, Uber flying taxis and, and all this kind of really cool stuff. But it, it's, it's a fascinating read. So you might want to just check it out. I think, you, I think, I think you'd enjoy it. It's, it's, it's the last point. You know, when you look at the movies that we've watched over the years, like Minority Report and being oh, able to coming. predict, right? Yeah. Like that stuff's real. That stuff has been, ha it, it happens, right? So when, so something like this is of interest. It is definitely of interest to me. Yep. But it's like, is, is it, uh, uh, is it real life uh, mimicking fiction or fiction mimicking real life? <laughs> That's another conversation. <laughs> but, 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 I, but I will check that out. You're absolutely right. Minority Report, a lot of that stuff you saw, that digital technology and the, the eyeball scanning and all that. 
that stuff's happening already. It's happening already. <laughs> it's, it's already out there. So <laughs> who knows what's going to happen? <laughs> we'll wake up and we'll be on the island. <laughs> <laughs> Is this the real world? <laughs> there you go. Or like, you know, like Elon Musk says, we're just simulations anyway. We're just... Right. <laughs> Uh, All right. so as we wind down here, we well, time flies when you're having fun. Um, I want to, first of all, thank you for sharing this time, this hour with us and, and inspiring, hopefully, the brothers who are watching this and let them know that there are definitely reasons for optimism. And like I said, I see you, uh, Tyrone, as a role model uh, that Black men should look up to because you don't have to be a multi-billionaire celebrity to be a role model. Uh, you are, you know, you're doing your thing. And, um, you know, you, you mentioned your family and how important that is, which is wonderful. And so I think, once again, black men just need to be exposed to these types of conversations. So thank you for engaging in this hour with us and sharing your wisdom and insight. And you mentioned that you don't necessarily get business from your website, but I do want to give you <laughs> to uh, put your website out there or your LinkedIn profile so people can find you. How would they find you? What's the best way? People can always connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm a pretty much open book on there, have been on it since the platform was invented. Um, in terms of website, tyronematheson.com, T-Y-R-O-N-E-M-A-T-H-E-S-O-N.com is uh, one of the websites that I have, but you're, you're gonna, if you reach out on there, you're going to get a hold of me on there as well. And, and how do they find you on LinkedIn, just by your name? Yeah, on LinkedIn, it's just by, by my name, okay. uh, by, my, by, by my name. And there will also be a link to his page underneath this video uh, when it posts. So you can, you can just click on a link and it'll take you right to his page. All right, my brother. So thank you so much for spending this hour with us. It's been a blast. I knew, I knew it would be. And as mentioned, I, I, I'm looking forward to whatever the universe has in store for us in the future, um, because I do believe we've been brought together for a divine purpose and we'll have to figure out what that is later. So again, thank you for, for, for hanging out with us. And thank you for, for having me and I'm, I'm wishing you great success because what you're doing, I can see becoming a necessity, especially in this day and age where uh, other uh, black young men can be connected with other black men. So this is an important platform. So I, I'm glad you're doing it. Yeah, and thanks for being a part of it. See, that's, that's the key. It's, it's all about collaboration and, and, and sharing some optimism. See, I think now more than ever, we need optimism. Yes, we know what the challenges are. But yes, there are lots of solutions and there are a lot more things that are right with the world than are wrong with the world. So Agree. that being said. So this has been another episode of Shattering Black Male Stereotypes. I want to thank my boy Tyrone for joining us today. And stay tuned for our next episode in which I'm going to talk a little bit more about relationships. Ah, yeah, juicy relationships. All right, guys, we'll see you next episode. Take care. <laughs>